Right, welcome everybody. We'll try again to this um, uh, our meet, first meeting of the planning committee in three months. Um, it's good to be back and welcome particularly to the members of our public who are looking in on this live streamed uh, meeting. There are bound to be one or two difficulties along the way because it can never be the same as meeting together. Um, but we'll do our best. And there are bound to be one or two little uh, stops, little hesitations, little deliberate breaks of service uh, while the equipment is messed about with. I don't quite know who's going to do that, um, but I'm quite sure we'll get by. It will need a bit of give and take on all our parts, but uh, I know colleagues, officers are well accustomed to my idiosyncrasies and I'm sure they won't let that get in the way of what ought to be a very positive meeting. Um, so I think, Bernadette, everybody is here, are we not? We know everybody's name is uh, members of the committee. Yeah. Uh, yes, Chairman, and just check that everybody can see and hear everybody else, if I may. Please. Yeah. Councillor oh. O'Hara. Well, I can see nine, I can't see any more. <laughs> Yeah, that's okay, Chairman. I think everybody can hear. Okay, that's fine. Um, I've got to ask that all our members keep their video on. There's a little button somewhere. Um, so that when it comes to speaking, uh, I know you'll put your hand up to, 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 to draw my attention. Um, the microphone, I suspect, is the more troublesome part of the equation. And uh, keep it mute at all times until you brought in to speak. And then when you have spoken, uh, would you remember to press that button to uh, mute yourself? Um, during the meeting, only members of the planning committee and supporting officers are present for the whole of the meeting. Everyone else who's got a part to play um, will be invited to join in at an appropriate moment. So that everyone who has been registered uh, with our officers um, will be invited to join the meeting for the duration of that particular application in which that particular person is concerned. Um, and of course, after that particular uh, part of it has been completed, uh, members of the public, indeed everybody is free to continue to watch it on the council's website. Um, that's by way of introduction. Um, as regards the procedure, I think it will follow uh, time hallowed, hallowed practice. Um, I will introduce each item. Um, I will ask our planning officer who's responsible for that particular item to present the application. Um, and then uh, people making representations for or against an application will have a maximum of seven minutes in which to make their points. And then again, if there is a ward council, I don't think there is today, but um, they would be allowed seven minutes again. Uh, members of the committee will then discuss that particular item, uh, raising their hand if they wish to speak. Uh, when it comes to the vote, again, I will ask for hands up for those in favour, hands up for those against. And uh, I will ask uh, Bernadette Jarvis, our committee clerk, if she will count the numbers and then uh, declare the result of that particular matter. Um, I think that's about it. Um, does any member have any particular comment or question to ask at this stage, or can we plough on? Um, no comment. I think that is deemed assent. Yeah. So if we go to item one on our agenda, declarations of interest. Um, I have one, and it's the last of our planning applications, item 10, three to five Westcliff Drive. 
I do have a disclosable pecuniary interest in that it's my place of work and all that goes with that. Anybody else? I should add, of course, that at that particular juncture, I will vacate the chair and it will be handed over uh, to Councillor David O'Hara as our vice chairman. So, sorry, Chairman, I think Councillor Gary Coleman's indicated. Sorry, Councillor Gary, yes, Coleman, come in. I couldn't see your hand waving. Please. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a um, prejudicial interest, please, in agenda item six, which is the intended approach for the determination of certificate of lawfulness applications relating to the proposed use of properties as residential children's homes. Uh, my wife is employed by one of the companies that could be impacted by the decision of the committee. So I will sit to that agenda, agenda item out, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cullen, that's fine. Um, and then if we can move to item two, the minutes of our last meeting held on the 11th of February. Um, they've all been circulated. Uh, would somebody move that we accept them as a true record? Uh, that's Councillor, Councillor, Councillor Stansfield. Seconded. Second. Uh, Councillor Williams. All in favour, thank you. Yeah. Those are accepted as a true record. Can we then turn to uh, item three? It's a report on enforcement matters, appeals lodged and determined. And item three, pages five to 12, uh, deals particularly uh, with planning appeals lodged. And I think you'll see other five altogether. I think there are five items. Is it your wish that we respond to those, appeal, that those appeals? Yeah. Agreed? Yeah. Thank you for that. And then we're on to item four, report on planning enforcement. And I think you will see uh, from the paper before you that the department never seems to have time um, to relax. Um, a huge body of work, 194 new cases being investigated since the beginning of the year. And uh, I think it's instructive how they are dealt with. Um, Section 215 notices for poorly maintained properties and others for breach of planning control. Um, they're just for noting the figures, but I, I think uh, they show what a remarkable work is going on in our community. So again, uh, just for noting, And then if we can turn to, pay, to page, to item five, planning applications, appeals performance. Um, again, I, I think it's instructive to see that our performance as a department with very minimal number of staff, it must be said, are doing a tremendous job um, with 100% of major items determined within the statutory 13 weeks, but even 84% of lesser items. Um, I, th I think it's a matter really where uh, our, our, our Susan and her team can be truly thanked uh, for the terrific work they do on behalf of the authority. Would you note that particular item? Noted. Thank you very much. Um, then turning to item six, this is an important piece of work. Um, in which several departments of the council have inevitably been involved. Um, obviously, children's matters, um, planning. Chair, sorry, before I stop you, can I just, um, Councillor Gary Coleman declared an interest in this, so he'll need to leave the meeting at this point. Is that all right, Councillor right. Coleman? Is he going to absent himself? Yeah. Turning? I'll, I'll I will, Chairman. That's fine. I tell you, it's um, you've got so many little things to watch. Right. Yes. Can, yeah. Councillor Coleman's now been put in the waiting room. He's out. He's out of it. Yeah. 
as I was saying, this has been a major piece of work in policy development. And um, I'm going to ask our head of planning to come in and present this particular paper. Susan Thank Parker. Thank you, Chairman. Can everybody hear me OK? Yes. yes. Yeah. Great. Um, this is an app. Well, this is a report that was on the agenda for the March meeting that, would that was obviously cancelled because of, of COVID. Um, we actually had an application that was due for determination around that time. And so the report itself was issued to members, uh, with the exception of Councillor Jackson, I'm, I'm afraid, because he weren't on the committee at that time. Um, so members have seen the report because we weren't sure what we were doing with committee in the future because of COVID. So hopefully you're all familiar with it, but I will give you a, a short pricey. Um, essentially, it's come to light over the last year or so um, that the council is struggling to accommodate its own looked after children within the borough. And yet we have 70 beds or 70 spaces for looked after children, which is significantly higher than other comparable areas. Um, and so we're finding that these spaces that we do have within the borough are taken up predominantly by looked after children from remote authorities. And this has become a concern, uh, both because of, of the struggle that we have to accommodate our own local children, but also given that the characteristics of the borough, the, the concern about bringing vulnerable young people in from outside of the area. Um, in addition to that, we have seen a steady increase in applications for well, for certificate of lawfulness applications, so significant increase in pressure for this kind of use. Um, and putting those two issues together, we, we sort of looked at it in more, more detail. And as, as Chair said, we did speak to colleagues from across the council, children's services, public protection and enforcement. We also spoke to colleagues in health, in public health and at the NHS. And this has significantly improved our understanding of children's homes, how they operate, what they involve. And taking all of those considerations together and looking at it in the Blackpool context, we do feel that we have a strong argument as a council to say that a change of use from a standard dwelling house, which is use class C3, to a, look, a children's home for looked after children, which is use class C2, we feel that we can make a strong argument for calling that a material change of use in planning terms, which means that it needs planning permission. Now, our approach in wanting to do this, or, or in feeling that we can do this, it, it's not to try and stop the creation of children's homes in Blackpool, because we know that there is a demand for that kind of provision. We know that in Blackpool, we, we generate looked after children who need to be accommodated. Um, what, what we have been doing, um, and what's happened since the first refusal of a certificate of lawfulness, we have seen applications coming in for properties in appropriate locations that children's services are happy with, suitable properties themselves um, relative to the number of children that are being housed. And what we are saying is that planning permission will be granted where that proposal is in accordance with the development plan, and particularly policy BH24, which relates to the provision of care homes, but also where the developer is prepared to sign up to a legal agreement that will enable children from the area to be placed first. So we're basically ensuring that any new provision responds to local need. Um, that there is a, a potential for children from outside of the area to be placed in Blackpool where children's services consider that to be appropriate. And that will happen because Blackpool has that um, same kind of reciprocal arrangement with uh, the neighboring um, council, which is Lancashire County Council. So there will be some uh, movement because obviously it's important to find the home that is the right facility for a particular child's needs. But we do feel that um, we, we can make an argument for the change of use being material in planning terms. And by requiring planning permission to be obtained for such uses, we will, moving forward, be able to ensure that local needs are met. So obviously we've, we've been through the, the factors that we've taken into consideration. These are set out in the report in the agenda that was, was sent to you. Um, so I think that's, that's everything from me. Does anybody have any queries or, or questions on that or? Chairman? Uh, Councillor Williams. Councillor Williams, you want to go ahead? 
I'm trying to unmute myself, sorry. Um, <laughs> no, it wasn't a question or, or a query, really. It was just a comment, um, which was just, you know, just so uh, very much support. This. Um, I know it's been, um, you know, quite an involved piece of work. And this is a, in terms of children being placed down to the area, this is a national problem. Um, you know, the Children's Commissioner, the head of Ofsted, have, have written about, you know, issues around children being passed around the country like baggage. But um, we particularly suffer with it, you know, which is shown from the statistics in terms of how we have to numbers of children we have to place outside of the area. So this does help us in, in, a, in a lot of ways combat the issue of market forces, which is driving what is essentially, you know, a private, you know, private businesses. So, um, yeah, I certainly support it. And I, and I, it will be you know, beneficial long term in that so that to ensure that any new businesses um, in this area in children's home have to work with the local authority and should prioritise local children. So, thank you thank very you. much indeed. Anybody else? Um, I suppose all of us are a little anxious when we develop a policy of this kind, um, when applicants, developers have become used to make a simple application for a certificate of lawfulness. And I suspect that we might find a bit of choppy water ahead. And uh, there is a risk of appeal, a risk of going down on appeal with particular sites. Um, but there has been a, a lot of um, consideration um, of one or two cases which are likely to be very helpful to us. Uh, and I, I'm sure our solicitor friend Ian uh, Curtis will probably uh, be aware himself of the Hertfordshire case of um, a couple of, what, eight or nine years ago now, um, where in fact this question about materiality and the context in which applications are taking place and the local political context is important. I don't know whether Ian wants to say a word about that. Yes, Jim, the key thing is that each case um, goes on its own merits and the merits of a particular case do depend on all of the contextual surroundings and the, the surroundings that uh, Susan has outlined about um, Blackpool in particular will be part of that context. Uh, I know that uh, this approach has been um, looked at by, um, by council uh, who has, uh, who has um, given the go ahead for it to be um, put to the committee. Um, and it's obviously it's, it's something which, which may like any planning application it may there may be appeals and those appeals will be need to be um, fought if there are appeals but it does look like um, your officers and others have laid the groundwork to be as successful uh, as they can be in those appeals if they do come piece of work um, the council is up against it in many areas and certainly the way we look after children in our care is always uppermost uh, and I think we all believe that this policy that I hope you will now be adopting or noting that we've already adopted it, I think, um, that is the way forward. So do we happily note that report? Yeah. Oh, Councillor Jackson, do you want to come in? Unmute. You'll have to press the button, Fred. Sorry. I'll get there eventually. No, I didn't want to speak, David. I was just indicating I agree. Oh, all right. Anybody else want to add anything? Right. Well, I, I think we're all very grateful, really, to uh, the United Forces of Legal uh, Children's Services and Planning that have put this uh, policy together. Uh, and I, I'm sure we wish it a fair win. Chair, can I just make one, one final comment? This this is an approach. It's not actually planning policy. Um, I don't wouldn't want there to be any confusion uh, with members thinking this is an actual no. policy that's part of the development plan. It's just an approach that we are taking. I stand Sorry. corrected as Sorry. always. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So are we happy with that, everybody? Yeah. Please show show of hands if we approve that particular measure. That's unanimous, Chair. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, can we now turn to the planning applications on our agenda? Chair, yeah, I'll just bring Councillor Gary Coleman back in at this point. 
Does he want to come back? Maybe he's happy being away. Welcome back, Gary. Yeah, Councillor Coleman joins us again. I hope you enjoyed your snooze. Right, um, planning application 2018 40 Abingdon Street. Um, I think who is going to present it? Is it count? Right. Yes, indeed. Uh, right, Susan going to deal with it. Miss Parker. Sorry, I'm just going to try and share my screen, so just bear with me. Well, Chair, I'll just bring the public speakers in for this item, if that's Indeed. okay. Yeah. So who who we, who's coming in? Oh. He's an objector. Mr. Deegan, right. So we'll take Mr. Deegan first, shall we? Or does it matter? I don't know. Hey, it's exciting, this ICT. <laughs> I'm worked up at the best of times. When it's like this, I don't know. I'm once more into the breach, dear friends. All right. Yes, please. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Could I just confirm who we uh, who we have joining us now, please? Yes, uh, it's Roger Etchells speaking. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Etchells. Thank you very much. I think you are here as an objector to this application on Abingdon Street. Thank yes, you. I am. Okay. Just um, hold your horses for a moment. Okay. I'll bring you in when, when, when we're ready for you. Fine. But, uh, yeah. And Mr. Deegan, I think. Oh, yes. Good afternoon. Mr. Deegan here speaking yes. in support. Welcome, Mr. Deegan. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Right. I think we're all met. So uh, I think, uh, Susan, are you coming in now to present the? Oh yes, let me. Uh, the application, Miss Parker, head of development. Thank you, Chair. Right. Oh. Can everybody see the uh, the PowerPoint? Okay. Yes. yes yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, members, this application is before you because of the level of public objection. Um, since the officer report was published as part of the agenda, an objection has also been received from the operator of the adjoining amusement centre. And these comments have been reproduced for members in the update notes. So I hope that you've all been able to have a look at that. Um, members should have also seen the fact sheet that's been produced by the applicant, which I believe has been appended to the update note. So again, hopefully you should have all uh, seen a copy of that. The application seeks planning permission for use as an adult gaming centre. As is set out in the officer report, an appeal decision granted planning permission for use of the adjoining property as an amusement centre in 2018, I think. Um, the inspector in that case concluded that the use was appropriate to the location and was in accordance with the key policies of the development plan, which were policy CS17 of the core strategy and policy BH18 of the local plan. In the inspector's view, an amusement or gaming centre would be unlikely to attract tourist custom and would not therefore undermine the character and function of the secondary shopping area. This kind of use is considered to be appropriate in secondary shopping areas. And the proposal is also considered to comply with policy SR6 of the local plan, which relates specifically to the retail cafe zone within which it sits. Um, the premises have been vacant since July 2017 and vacancy rates in the general area are higher than the national average. The benefits of establishing an active use in this reasonably prominent position therefore weigh significantly in favour of the scheme. 
Given the significant investment and development in the town centre that is ongoing, it is to be hoped that viability improves in this area. And the inspector of the case for the adjoining property did judge that such uses contribute to the vitality and viability of town centres. It is recognised that there are other vacant premises in the area, but there is no reason to suppose that an approval in this instance would lead to a harmful over-concentration of such uses. And BH18, which is a key policy, does not seek to limit the level of the amusement centre development in the areas where such uses are considered appropriate. It is noted that emerging policy DM13 does seek to avoid an over-concentration of such uses, but as this policy in the uh, local plan part two remains at an early stage of development, little weight can be attached to it at present. It is noted that an objection has been raised to the opening hours. However, these have been agreed with the council's environmental protection team. And in addition, noise insulation measures have also been conditioned. On this basis, it's considered that no unacceptable noise nuisance would be expe expected. So overall, given the commercial character of Abingdon Street, no unacceptable impact on the character of the conservation area would result. And on this basis, members are respectfully recommended to grant planning permission for the use. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that introduction. Um, it is recommended for approval, subject to the conditions set out on pages 41 and 42 of your paper, uh, six conditions in all. Um, I think it might be as well, before we get on to the debate, colleagues, um, if, uh, first of all, the object and objections to the proposal are heard. So I would invite Mr. Roger Etchells, um, if he would speak for not more than seven minutes to tell us why there are misgivings about this application. The chairman, uh, I hope you can hear me. I represent three of the traders in the vicinity that's to say Warwick's Amusements, the Abingdon Barbecue, which is immediately next door, and Tina's Cafe, all in Abingdon Street. And you'll note there are a number of other objectors uh, in this case, quite surprising given the level, uh, quite surprising level of objection given the uh, lockdown that we've been experiencing in the last uh, few weeks. Anyway, to move to the, the recommendation, on the first page of the report is a summary of that recommendation, which I'm going to look at in particular in these few minutes. Firstly, it is said to be consistent with saved policy BH18. And then there are six other material considerations that are said to weigh in its favor. Dealing firstly with the policy aspect, what is uh, in my view, not given sufficient weight is policy SR6, which is again a similar saved policy from the local plan, which says the proposals which would be detrimental to the character of the area as one that caters primarily for the pedestrian shopper and cafe user will not be permitted. So if you're with me and agree that it would be detrimental to that character, you have policy backing for a refusal. Then turning to the list of six other reasons to grant permission, that's what uh, this section two is doing. Points one and two refer to the vacancy rate and the length of vacancy. Dealing firstly with the, um, uh, the uh, length of vacancy, uh, my uh, investigation suggests that the property is being marketed at a figure some 20% more than the district valuers view of the value of it. And therefore perhaps it's no surprise that it's not been taken. Uh, obviously it's uh, dealt with in your officer's report that there are streets with vacancies and perhaps this is one with more. But one needs to bear in mind, of course, that uh, the whole thing's up in the air at the moment following the coronavirus and whatnot. And uh, this isn't a good justification for making what would otherwise be a, a bad planning reason. So we would invite you to say, well, it's a being too much rents being asked and it would otherwise be occupied or have as much chance of being occupied as any other shop in the street. 
Thirdly, the small size of the premises. Well, it's not small. Look at the uh, look at the size shown on the OS sheet. It's twice the size of uh, Warwick's premises next door. And to be frank, it looks about average for the street. It isn't unduly small. And so we say, well, there's nothing in that one. So far as the frontage improvements are concerned, that's the fourth issue. Well, what you're getting, what you've been invited to, to accept here is two new columns on either side of an existing shop front, a new sign, well, of course, they'd have a new sign anyway, and painting the existing shop front. Uh, and uh, that's the advantage that you have in terms of frontage improvements. And bear in mind, we're in the conservation area here. And bear in mind also Blackpool Civic Trust's objection, which you'll see later on in the report. Fifthly, the employment benefits. Five staff was what was offered at the application stage. Now, since then, the hours have been reduced because they were wanting to trade 24 hours a day. So five staff is now down to, I don't know what, but it's less than five. It, hardly a substantial uh, increase. And given the potential impact on the existing amusement premises offering exactly the same thing next door, will there actually be any increase at all? Will they both survive? There's some question in my mind about that. And so the employment benefits are, in my mind, dubious. Sixthly, year-round trading. Well, that's not unusual in Abingdon Street. Most of the shops in Abingdon Street open all year round. So there's nothing special about that. And certainly no reason why uh, permission should be, should be granted. Now, what's been said to you is the inspector at, at um, Warwick's appeal um, said that it um, would extend the range of facilities and of course, he said there would not be an oversaturation of such uses. He was dealing with the first one in the street. <coughs> this would extend, this wouldn't extend the range of, of, of facilities. It would be exactly the same as what's already there. And it would be an oversaturation because it's right slap bang next to an existing premises of exactly the same type. So I don't see that the uh, inspector's letter can be uh, said to support in all respects as is being suggested uh, the uh, recommendation that's been made to you and of course bear this in mind that justification the inspector's decision letter is a justification for a uh, grant of permission anywhere in the secondary shopping area uh, are, are this company or others going to come on uh, and, and make further applications a worrying a worrying possibility I would invite you to refuse, and I would uh, invite you to refuse on the basis of fav I beg your pardon, of saved policy SR6, and the fact that it would give rise to an unacceptable concentration of such uses, harmful to the character and appearance of the, of the street and of the conservation area. I'd also invite you to conclude that it would attract no more trade to the centre nor to this part of the centre. It's a harmful duplication, harmful to the vitality and viability of the shopping area. And, I'm, and I would therefore invite you to refuse planning permission. Thank you for having given me the opportunity of speaking. Still got the application planning for. Okay, um, shall we have Mr. Deegan before um, Miss Parker comes back to respond? Mr. Sam Deegan, agent for the applicant. Thank you, Chair. Now, good afternoon, Chair and members. Uh, my name is Sam Deegan. I'm the agent acting on behalf of Casino Gaming Limited who are, as you know, seeking planning permission to change the use of 40 Abingdon Street into an adult gaming centre, along with the physical alterations to the front elevation, including, of course, a new signage scheme. Um, prior to today's meeting, I have provided members with copy of a client's brochure, 
which I hope provides a useful overview of how they operate and their nature of the business. Your professional planning officer has clearly set out the planning case for this application within the officer report. So I, I want to use this time to highlight some key points. Um, 40 Abingdon Street is located within the secondary shopping area and the extended town centre conservation area. The unit, as mentioned, was previously occupied by a betting shop, um, so it has a sui genus lawful use, but has sat vacant since July 2017, nearly three years despite a very active online marketing campaign. The interest in the unit during those three years has been limited at best, with three hot food takeaways expressing an interest, along with a charity shop. However, not one of those four materialised into uh, a visit or indeed an offer. The unit's, unit's frontage is falling into disrepair as a result of the vacancy. The blue cracked tiles that form the stall riser and pilaster are deteriorating, as is the shoddy appearance of the fascia backboard. It will continue to fall into disrepair, disrepair um, and detract from the conservation area unless it receives investment. Working alongside the conservation officer, my client agreed to introduce a sympathetic shopfront and signage scheme, complying with core, core strategy policies CS7 and CS8. The conservation officer has now offered support for the scheme. A minimum of five jobs will be created. I appreciate the objector queried the amount, but five jobs as a minimum will be created. And whilst this is a small economic benefit, it is certainly one that can't be ignored, even more so now, given the current economic climate. The proposal will generate footfall and link trips to neighboring commercial units. This is a well-documented positive highlight by planning inspectors in recent planning appeals for adult gaming centers. The officer report highlights the high levels of vacancy within the core retail area and town center as a whole. And there is no doubt that bringing this vacant unit back into economic use will help support the function, vitality and viability of the town centre in line with policy CS17. The objector who spoke before me on behalf of Warwick Amusements made reference to the fact that this proposal will result in a duplication of the existing amusement centre next door and as by result will result in an over concentration of this type of use. I must point out that this is a commercial objection and should be given limited weight. I must also stress that my client's offer is very different to the offer next door. If there wasn't demand for this type of use, my client would have no interest in locating here. The brochure details the range of games available um, that will be available, should I say, at my client's premises, which includes bingo and other games. These are currently not on offer at Warwick Casinos at Amusements. It will, by nature, therefore bring choice and competition into the market, and that is a long-standing aspiration of national policy. My client does not have a presence in Blackpool, but Warwick Amusements has three premises in Blackpool, emphasising the anti-competitive nature of the objection. I must also state that there is nothing in adopted policy or national policy that seeks to prevent my client's proposal in this location. The proposal complies with policy SR6, which acknowledges that adult gaming centres form part of the shopping scene. Policy BH11 encourages this type of use and does not seek to resist the number of adult gaming centres, nor does it include a specific over-concentration criteria. And I think that's a very key point. The officer's recommendation has been formulated following a detailed assessment of the relevant local policy and not past appeal decisions. It is also important to highlight that the opening hours sought are not 24 hours and are consistent with opening hours recently granted for a nearby nightclub. The, the nightclub um, operation uh, in, in proximity is, is very different in terms of how my client's operation will function. Indeed, it's very quiet operation and, and certainly not comparable. There is also no residential use of directly above my applicant's unit, um, nor will there be any residential use above in the future because the first floor is, in, is completely void and is actually inaccessible.
because there is no staircase in place. Now, working alongside the head of environmental protection, who is supportive of the proposed opening hours, my client has agreed to soundproof the unit and install self-closing front door. So of course, no amplified music is audible from the street. In turn, by way of amenity consideration, this will comply with the requirements stipulated by BH3. In, sum in summary, there are simply no policy grounds to refuse this application. I therefore ask you to support your professional planning officer's recommendation to approve this application so that the social, economic and environmental components of this scheme can be realised. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Deegan. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Susan Parker if she would uh, step in now and give uh, the professional uh, comment on what has been said to committee. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm not sure I, I have actually anything much to add to that. Uh, I would again remind members that issues of commercial competition are not a valid planning consideration. Um, as uh, Mr Deegan said, we, we have looked at the, the relevant policies of the development plan and we have taken into account the inspector's views because obviously they are a material consideration. Um, as is set out in the report, we do feel that this is uh, an application that accords with policy and that we couldn't uh, but would struggle to justify or defend a refusal, hence the recommendation that we've made to you. Thank you very much indeed. As you say, the report before us is very comprehensive, goes through all the issues and uh, amply justifies the recommendation for approval. Uh, colleagues, anybody want to step in and join in the debate on this? Uh, Councillor Williams, please. Unmute. Keep clicking the wrong button. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, um, I, do, I do have some concerns um, about about this. I have to say um, because I, I think the over proliferation, um, and I would like to know really what Susan when um, if Susan could say because we can place some weight, little weight. It doesn't say no weight on. Is it DM thirteen? Um, because it, it it feels like we are you know do something which we've already we've had discussions and um, obviously you know indications would have come from us as a committee in terms of, of around this over proliferation. Um, you know I don't want to go back over all the arguments that we, you know we've, we've discussed before at this committee, but about you know the, the regeneration of the town centre. Um, how we want it to be, how we want it to look, how we want to, you know, attract families, et cetera, and increase footfall. And that, you know, there is already, I mean, I think, I'm sure it was in the report that there is a, you know, we're higher than the average proliferation density of, of this this kind of type. Not, I've got nothing against adult gaming centres. I just, um, the, the fact that we have another one next door to another one, with all, you know, with the only few others in a town centre, when we've actually going to be shortly implementing a policy um, that um, that we, you know, that, that we're not happy, and there are reasons why um, that we, you know, that policy has been is about to be implemented um, once we've got approval. Um, so that, that's well, that's where I'm at it, and, I, and I'm also concerned, Chair, that um, I've read mentioned in the papers about the. Because obviously the notices were given out during lockdown, whether the number of um, businesses in the, the locality, because I'm, I, Susan, again, you can clarify this, whether they would have obviously been delivered to the local businesses, wouldn't they? they um, and whether, to the, whether, you know, people have, who maybe would have voiced concerns or, um, you know, they'll probably have obviously be of the, the same nature, but uh, it, that does concern me that maybe that, uh, because of the nature of, you know, it's businesses around there during lockdown, other people may not be, have been aware and had time to, ob to object. Uh, that's thank it, Chair, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Any, anybody else? Uh, Councillor Hugo, please. Councillor Hugo. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, now, yes, that's fine. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I'd kind of like to reiterate what uh, Councillor Williams has um, highlighted there, but also the fact that uh, the tramway um, 
project will soon be up and running. So my concern is um, around this idea that Abingdon Street isn't in the town centre um, and therefore it doesn't really fall into to some of these policies, whereas soon it, it will be a link between there and the development at the Winter Gardens. Um, I've also been uh, contacted by a couple of members of the public who have been unable to follow the process to object because um, they didn't hear about it quickly enough, again, following on from what Councillor Williams has highlighted there. Um, and again, I was interested to hear what Mr. Etchell said about the inspector talking about over concentration, um, but that was before Warwick's were given permission. So I don't really see how that applies when Warwick's is there right next door. Um, they're, they're my views. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think Councillor Stansfield, did you want to come in? <coughs> Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yeah, I've listened to quite uh, quite well to all what's been said um, by the objector and the um, agent. Um, there's a few things that concern me. Firstly, the talk again about the footfall in the area. But we all know the footfall in the area has been down over the last two years because of the development that's going on with Talbot Road. Um, so I don't see that the, the fact that this has been empty uh, is going to be filled very easily because of everything else that's going on. And I know it's going to be improvement in the long run, but it doesn't mean to say that we should jump on the first application that comes in. Um, the agent referred to the proposal not being for 24 hours, seven days a week. Yet 12.1 of the report states that the proposal is for 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, that in itself I, I take concern with because we do have major problems within the town with drug addiction, alcohol addiction and gambling addiction. Um, it doesn't matter which way you look at this, it is a gaming centre which is going to fuel that 24 hours a day, seven days a week in the end. So I do, I do have a problem with that. Um, I'll smell that down here. And again, to go back to the, um, <clears throat> the appeal one, <clears throat> it's not the first time that we've had an application for a gaming centre. Um, I'm sure it won't be the last. Is it really what we actually want to make our town centre or town centre area, surrounding area up of? Um, it's a personal thing. I don't think it, it, it supports the town centre. I think we've got what we need. And just because we are Blackpool, which is a bingo, or as used to be a bingo and gaming centre all on the promenade, I don't think we need it in the town centre. And there's various, those, those reasons, that's why I think that the, uh, the application shouldn't be. Uh, going ahead. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Stansfield. Anybody? Uh, Councillor Robertson, please. Thank you, Chair. Chair, there's a couple of points I'd like to pick up on that Mr. Dagan put across. He said it was going to be a nightclub. Um, it's advertised as an adult gaming centre, but it's going to be a nightclub. And also, He's also putting in automatic doors that are going to close to keep the loud music out. Now, why would a, an adult gaming centre have loud music going anyway? That's my two points I'd like to put across anyway. But I, I think it's not going to be a nightclub. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. I, I can't say that I throw my hat up in the air in uh, support of this application. I, I think we've got very real concerns in areas of considerable deprivation and this is just about on the fringe of it all is it Brunswick Ward um, it's not the ideal of place it certainly isn't aimed at holiday makers I wouldn't have thought it is going to be for largely for residents and people out shopping um, but uh, there's such a, a pressure on people's finances these days that you wonder whether it's we should be encouraging such a development anybody else Colleagues, uh, Councillor Jackson, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I just make reference to the Blackpool Civic Trust objections? I'm not a member of the Civic Trust, so I've no uh, 
link with them apart from you no know, following what they've got to say. And um, they, they indicate in their comment that in order for DM13, that the applicant has to jump through a large number of hurdles. Uh, I'd like to hear from Susan if it's possible, or have has that actually taken place? Has the applicant had to jump through a number of hurdles, or is that just a view of the civic trust that's not correct? Because I do share the concerns, um, and as Councillor Williams, I think, mentioned at the very beginning, one of the things that we've been trying to do as a council is to perhaps reduce the number of gambling places in the town because of the deprivation that we have and the temptation that that puts in place to other pe people who are in that situation. And um, I know that's maybe not a planning matter, but it is a concern and it's something that I would like to know whether this applicant has jumped through these hurdles in a correct way. Anybody else? Uh, Councillor Coleman? Your hand is up, sir. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah. I mean, I, my, my worries may be mute now. I'm listening to the general consensus, consensus of the committee. Um, but I just want to question if, if the plan does get the go ahead. Um, security that will be available in the early hours of the, um, the morning, because as has been previously mentioned, there are concerns about the um, some of the clientele in the immediate vicinity to Abingdon Street at such an early time. Uh, and do we know, I'm aware of Malloy's and um, using the time frame that Malloy's are open, but what other premises are within that vicinity? Um, what hours are they allowed to be operating until? Um, so, as I say, these, these concerns may be mute now, but um, if there is an answer, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. Right. Nobody else is signifying. So, um, Susan, if you want to come back. Oh, sorry. I didn't see Councillor O'Hara. You've only got a little hand. Come in, Vice Chairman. Need to unmute. All oh, right. You're okay it's now. Just, yeah, generally agree with most of what everybody else has said. But the question is, last time we went through all this and we said the same sort of things and we were overruled and yeah. the appeal was was granted. We, we've got a worry in Blackpool about all the additional amusement arcades that are going to happen because that's that's the way things are going to go by the look of it. And I just think I can agree with most of what everybody else has said. But the question is, how do we stand if there's an appeal? Uh, Ms Parker. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll try and come back on, on everything that's been mentioned. I think a number of points there um, overlap to some extent. Uh, Councillor Williams asked how much weight can be put on to DM13 as an emerging policy. Um, it, it's not hard and fast. The amount of weight that can be attached does increase as you go through the process and also additional weight can be added if there are no objections to a policy. But at the moment, the local plan part two hasn't been published for examination. So at this stage, we, we really it's minimal weight that can be attached to a policy. We would be taking a, a significant risk if we try to base a refusal on a policy that hasn't even been published for examination yet. So um, professionally, I, I couldn't recommend that, that the council do that. Um, in terms of uh, Councillor Jackson's comments and also uh, Councillor Stansfield, you talked about um, well, us jumping on the first application that's come in. It's an, you know potentially unfortunate fact in planning that we, we have to deal with the application that is in front of us. And at this moment in time, this is the application that we're looking at. Um, as you quite rightly say, mindful of the concerns that we have in Blackpool, uh, we are bringing in a policy into the, the new local plan that would prevent over concentration of such uses. We're not there yet. And unfortunately, this application is in here and now. So we have to determine it at the moment without policy DM13 being in place. So I, I think what the Civic Trust have done, Councillor Jackson, they have looked at DM13 and sought to apply it in full to this application, which of course we can't do yet because it hasn't been adopted. So I think that's a basis of the... Um, the Civic Trust's comments. In terms 
of the uh, councillor hugo mentioned the proximity to the town centre the site is within the town centre boundary but in accordance with national approach we have to identify primary and secondary areas of the town centre so the primary shopping centre is as you might expect around the hounds hill centre and those key streets abingdon street is still within the town centre but it is identified as a secondary shopping area which is why under the current policy framework this kind of use um, can be supported. As, as we've said, moving forwards under DM13, um, we will be adopting a, a stricter approach to these areas. Um, Councillor Robertson asked about, asked about it being a nightclub. I, I think uh, that Mr Deegan was making reference to a, a nightclub um, elsewhere in the town centre. There is no proposal for this to be a nightclub. Um, and the, the propping open of a door, I suppose any gaming machine will make some noise that's just to be an additional safeguard to prevent noise from spilling out, particularly in the, the early hours when uh, background noise levels are lower. So that's not a response to an anticipation of, of loud noise or music or anything else. It's a safeguard uh, more than anything. Um, and Councillor Coleman asked about security. Um, I've got to find that that might be something that uh, we asked Mr Deegan about if, if the chairman is, is happy to do that. It's not something that I, I, I can answer. But in terms of other premises opening late in that area, that there are relatively few. I know there are a couple of premises on um, Clifton Street, um, of, uh, Hogarth Springs to mind, and also uh, West Coast Rock Cafe will open, I imagine, until 11 o'clock midnight uh, sort of time. Um, but yeah, obviously, that this is more of a transition area, so you are moving away from perhaps more of the nighttime economy on Queen Street towards the town centre retail, which is why perhaps they are a bit more sporadic. Um, and as Councillor O'Hara raised at the end, the, the concerns are there. We appreciate them. You raised them last time and, and you know, we, we took it to appeal and, and we fought the argument. Um, the inspector looked at that proposal in light of the current framework and, and felt that permission should be granted before policy DM13 comes in as an adopted policy, I feel that we are in the same situation with this application. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for that. Uh, I think everybody's contributed who wants. Um, it's time to proceed to a vote. The recommendation is for approval. Um, nobody's moved an amendment to that. Um, so, the, so, would somebody move approval? Is it moved for approval? Chair, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I... I um, Councillor Williams. Hello. Yeah, I, I feel... Um, I understand what Susan has said, but I do feel um, kind of very conflicted as, as a planning committee member um, in terms on the basis that we, we you know, we have held, I, I was, as you will appreciate, Chair, I was the chair when we last dealt with um, the next door's premises. And we had, you know, following discussions because it was felt very strongly then, as is now, um, not that this was not, we did not wish this there to be further density of adult gaming and the tights in, in the town centre. Um, we discussed all the primary and secondary um, and it kind of like being stuck sort of in a loop. Um, and I don't, I don't feel that I can approve something which um, is a gen, I understand all those issues around in terms of the policy being prepared, but I think if we can put forward an argument um, as to the reasons why that DM13 is necessary and required, um, that you know to protect that that all of the development that is and going the impact upon on amenity. Um, that's my view, Chair. I'm sorry. I just I, you, when we've got the even that this policy is, is in the life, you know, is is a, is not yet there. But I don't feel that um, I think to. Uh, for me to approve it would ignore all of the concerns that we have raised previously about about this application and the previous one. I'm going to curtail discussion on this matter because in the light of what's been said in the debate, um, I don't think we're in a position to proceed to a vote on either for it or against it. So 
with your agreement, colleagues, I'm going to adjourn discussion on this matter and uh, have a decision taken at the next planning committee. Is everybody agreeable about that? Yeah, hands up, please, if you'll, if we agree to adjourn discussion on this particular application. Chair, just before you, you, you take the vote, can I just check on what grounds you defer in the application, please? Well, it's, it's to take into account the views that have been expressed uh, in committee. Um, I didn't get a proposal for a, approval. And it seems uh, that if we went to a vote at this particular stage, um, the recommendation is likely to be at risk. And I think we need to discuss uh, if the matter is to be um, uh, decided. I think we do need some cogent planning uh, grounds for a refusal. Um, but as matters stand, I think we need to consider um, and decide at the next meeting um, whether or not it is approved or it's refused. Okay. Chair, can I, can I clarify? It is the committee uh, looking for us to negotiate a particular amendment to this scheme or what, what, is, a, actually, what is a committee? Can the committee clarify what they want me to, to do um, before next meeting, please? Thank you. Councillor Williams. Um, I'm not really sure, Susan. Um, I, um, hmm, I, I'm struggling with that one, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I, and I think, I think the other issue that we have um, that, that I think Councillor Hugo and I had raised was the um, about notice, insufficient notice bit having been given um, to the other businesses. Um, I, I think that that is also an issue. Um, but in terms of the um the other reasoning I, I am I'm not sure that I can assist further chair I'm sorry sorry I, I did write down the lockdown issue because I think a couple of people people mentioned it um yes it, this has been a, a difficulty that I think all planning authorities have faced um what central government has been clear about is that the planning system must continue, planning decisions must continue to be made. We must basically publicise applications as best we can do. In this case, uh, neighbour letters were sent out as would normally happen. Site notices were displayed, I know because I did it. Um, so we have put site notices up outside the premises as we would normally do. So we, we have advertised the application as best we can do. And central government has been quite clear um, the, planning, the planning system must continue to operate in, in the face of COVID. Um, so that, that would be the only response I could make to that. Um, just thank you. Your hand is up, are you wanting to move something? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I really struggle with the fact that we're looking to kick this into the grass to the next meeting. It seems that the committee, um, there seems to be a, a consensus today, and surely we should take the vote today, one would imagine, on listening to the advice from our professionals as well. I feel that the vote should be taken today, Mr Chair. Um, I don't know how my colleagues are feeling with that fact, and I'd like to hear, please. Thank you, Chair. The simple fact is that we haven't had a motion put to the committee. Um, the recommendation is to approve it. Uh, Chair, I, I, so, um, as you might have anticipated, what my uh, proposed motion would be, um, it would be to refuse the application. 
Um, I don't know if that assists in in terms of I can I do I kind of agree with with Councillor Coleman. I don't think um, it really serves any particular purpose further. You know, deferring it to the next meeting. I think if we make a decision one way or the other now, and um, so that's my uh, motion, Chair. Could I make a suggestion, Chair, uh, with respect, if that is members' intention today, um, would it be useful to the committee if the decision was made and we come up with reasons for refusal that are then agreed by the committee at next meeting, or would they delegate authority to you to agree those reasons for refusal in the interim? Mm -hmm. You've heard that suggestion from Miss Parker. Um, Councillor Williams has moved uh, a refusal uh, with object with the reasons for that refusal to be considered by our planning team. Is that seconded? Councillor Stansfield. I'll second that, Chair. Okay. Chairman, before you take the vote, I'm sorry to uh, interrupt, but. Uh, Taking into account what you're proposing to, it might be better if you, if what you decided to do as a committee was that you were minded to refuse, uh, and the important words minded to refuse, with that decision coming back to the next meeting, so that there's no perception of you having decided to make the decision before having decided on the reasons, so they all come at the same time. Thank you, Chairman. I'm grateful to that, uh, Mr. Curtis. Um, so, uh, if Councillor Williams is happy with that amendment to her proposal? Um, yes, um, indeed, Chair, thank you. The committee is minded to refuse the application, uh, a decision to be taken at the next meeting. And in the meantime, our officers uh, will consider what we have said in debate and suggest uh, appropriate conditions. And at that stage, we may still decide to approve on the other hand, we may refuse. Is that is that uh, our way forward? Yep. Would every, would please can we have a show of hands for those in favour? Um, Mrs. Jarvis to count. Those against. For so unanimous, there, Chairman. That's unanimous. Well, thank you very much indeed. We made a bit of heavy weather for that, but we've had a good discussion and uh, we'll come back to it at our next meeting. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we, no we now turn to item eight on your agenda, planning application to, for development at 4751 Shaftesbury Avenue. Um, this is a matter that Mr. Shaw has been deeply involved in, and I invite him on your behalf to present his report. Chairman, sorry, just before I start, am I all right to bring in the public speakers for this item, please? Um, I'm stunned. Yes, I'm, I'm rather naughty there, aren't I? Please do so. So if Mr. Hebson as an objector, and uh, we've got uh, Chris Wheatman, agent, and Cara Harrington, manager, uh, in support of the application. Is everybody in? Mr. Hebson, Mr. Wheatman, Miss Harrington. Everybody seems to be in, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. Well, welcome, uh, uh, Mr. Hebson. Welcome, Mr. Wheatman and uh, Miss Harrington. Um, the recommendation on this particular application is for a refusal, um, but we defer now to, uh, to uh, it's uh, Mark Shaw who's going to present the reasons for the paper. 
Mr Shaw. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, the application properties occupy the, the right-hand pair of semi-detached houses um, on the, on the uh, Google Maps um, view on the screen at the moment. Um, it's a 21-bed um, care home, which I understand also caters for people with dementia. As a result of the application, it would increase up to 26 residents and it, the increase would be achieved by extending the home into the the left hand um, semi detached house on the on the Google Maps extract. So it would occupy three of the, the block of six. Um, and also it would involve a link extension, physical link uh, set back from the frontage of the property at two storey level. It's a two storey link between the property to provide five en suite bedrooms. Um, the, pro the pair of properties that form the rest home at the moment have already been extended quite considerably. You can see on the, uh, on the, on the plan in front of you what was the rear garden um, of 49 has, has, been, has been filled with a, an extension. Um, those extensions are both single and two-storey. Uh, you can also see the parking layout. Uh, these eight spaces shown, four access from the side road. Um, which I think is Argyle Avenue, and uh, four at the front between 47 and, or between the, the pair of the, exist, uh, the, the existing home and 51 um, Shaftesbury Avenue. Those spaces are tandem, i.e. two spaces blocking another two spaces. It's important to note that number 53, um, which is the other half of the, of the semi to 51, is a single family dwelling house that's one of the that's one of the concerns with the application how it would impact on that property and 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 on a larger level how it would impact on the character of the of the immediate area um we've had 13 letters of objection to the application you'll note from the report including a letter from paul maynard mp uh, and we've also had 22 letters of support including from two neighbours, but most of the letters of support are um, on behalf of residents, either existing or previous residents of the, of the home. The application hinges on, on two elements. It's uh, the interpretation of policy BH24, which relates to residential institutions, and also the design implications of the extension in terms of how, how it would appear as a link between the two pairs of semi-detached houses, its design, its uh, its appearance, and 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 whether that would be appropriate. Um, in terms of policy BH24, that relates to residential institutions. The policy seeks to protect the character and, and amenities um, of residential areas and to avoid undue concentrations of of um, rest rest homes, as in as it is in this instance. And the policy specifies that residential, residential institutions must not exceed about 10% of the block. And secondly, it must be located at least 400 metres from similar uses. Um, the 10% of the block uh, element is crucial in this instance. The, the locational element in relation, in relation to it requiring 400 metres between similar uses does not apply. We've got a, uh, an instance where this, this proposal would occupy three out of six um, properties within the block between uh, Argyle and Gosforth Avenue. The policy, um, BH24, in terms of definition of the block, has been clarified. A report was taken to what was the development control, what was then the development control committee, uh, and that defined the block. Um, as the immediately adjoining property frontage within which a property itself is located, i.e. a straight run of properties. Uh, it also clarified that this should not exceed, normally exceed 100 metres in either direction, and it should not be less than 10 properties or 75 metres. In this instance, we've got three out of the six properties within the block, that is less than the, um, the, the qualification, uh, um, 
criteria that's set out in the in the in the in the in the policy. We've we've we sought to extend the policy beyond this block um, to include the two adjoining blocks, which would be uh, the that block uh, uh, that section of Shaftesbury Avenue between Cornwall Avenue and Clayator Avenue. That length is approximately 180 metres, um, and this proposal would result in three out of 15 properties within that 180 metre length, three out of 15 being in residential institution use, which is 20% of the block, which is um, double what the, the policy allows for. Um, the other element relates to the design of the extension. I'm sure members will make their own mind up on the, the appropriateness of the extension in terms of whether it's in keeping with the area. Um, one, one concern just to highlight is the, the amount of glazing at ground floor level. Um, there's also a concern about how the, in extending the home into the adjoining semi-detached house and linking it, uh, how it would impact on 53 Shaftesbury Avenue. We've had representations from several local residents, including from 53 Shaftesbury Avenue itself. Um, and there's a concern about the four of the five bedrooms would be adjoining the party wall of that house. So it would adjoin the principal living rooms and the principal bedrooms of that adjoining house. Um, but also in terms of the extra traffic coming and going from the, um, from the extended home and also the use of the garden. So cumulatively, that's also considered to be a concern, but you'll note the two reasons for refusal, uh, which are namely that the application is contrary to BH24, which have, have sought to, to clarify what it's, um, how, it's, how it's interpreted and also on design grounds. Thank you, Chair. I'm sorry, Miss Parker wants to come in. Did you? Oh, well, yeah. Um, anyway, it's a long standing policy of the council that we do um, control the density of care homes, uh, as is recommended in the report for refusal of this application. Um, I've got, we've got uh, Mr. Hebson, who's uh, one of the objectors, and I wonder whether he wants to come in. He has seven minutes in which to address us and make his points. Mr. Hebson. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me to address the committee regarding our objections to this inconsiderate proposal. My name is Michael Thorne Hebson, and together with Mr. Marin Serbu, I own and live in number 53 Shaftesbury Avenue which is the semi-detached house adjoining the application property. We strongly object to this proposal and we urge you to reject this application, which clearly conflicts with several council planning policies. This unsympathetic and ill-conceived proposal would in effect, turn our valued peaceful semi-detached home into an end of terrace property adjoining an over-intensive commercial use. The four rooms that adjoin our party wall at ground and first floor level would be converted into ensuite bedrooms to accommodate additional elderly residents, including dementia patients. There would be the significant potential for disturbance in our own home from excessive <coughs> noise in the care home. The impact on our quality of living would be totally unacceptable and contrary to local plan policies which seek to protect the amenities of occupiers of adjacent properties. This is particularly important to us as Mr. Sabu is an NHS frontline worker at Blackpool Victoria Hospital. He works shifts including nights and he is studying a degree course in adult nursing at University of Central Lancashire. Peaceful daytime sleep and also quiet time to study is therefore essential at times. There would be months of intense unacceptable noise and disturbance during the building works to convert the rooms adjoining our home to install a lift, block up the front door and knock out walls to join the new linked building. The arrival of ambulances during the night, the comings and goings of staff on night shift 
and the numerous vehicles visiting the care home already caused disturbance and inconvenience for us and our neighbours, as confirmed in letters of objection from nearby residents. The increased comings and goings associated with the extended nursing home, emergency admissions, staff arriving for night shifts, visits by doctors, district nurses, ambulances, commercial deliveries of supplies for the home and the kitchens would be out of keeping in this quiet residential area, causing further disturbance for us and our neighbours. Our enjoyment of our small private rear garden is already at times disturbed by noise from the home. This would undoubtedly increase if the garden to number 51, immediately adjoining our garden, was to be used for increased activities, as outlined in the submitted plans and documents. There would also be the further loss of privacy in surrounding neighbours gardens, caused by overlooking from the new bedrooms, particularly in the link building. The proposal would result in the extended three original, relatively small semi-detached houses being occupied by 26 elderly residents, with a sizable lounge, dining room, kitchens and staff accommodation. This represents an over-intensive commercial use of this relatively small site in an established residential area. The increased intensity of use and consequent detrimental effects on our living conditions would adversely affect the enjoyment, the enjoyment of our and our neighbours' homes. The surrounding area has an attractive, predominantly residential character. The original pair of semi-detached houses, now occupied by the care home, have already been substantially extended to the rear and to the side, where a large incongruous two-storey extension fronts Argyle Road. The proposed two-storey extension to link the home to the application property would be a substantial over-intensive development of this restricted site that would create an uncharacteristic terrace of four houses. This, together with the bricking up of the front door, would significantly detract from the balanced, established character and appearance of the area, contrary to several planning policies as set out in your officer's report and the high design standards of the National Planning Policy Framework. The application states that two new parking spaces would be created to increase provision to eight, but these are not new spaces. They simply make use of the drive to number 51 for tandem parking, which in itself causes further disturbance when the innermost car needs to be moved. Furthermore, eight spaces seems insufficient for a care home with visitors to 26 residents 20 staff in total, albeit on shifts, commercial vehicles, ambulances, doctors, nurses, deliveries, etc. It would undoubtedly increase parking congestion in surrounding roads and impact on highway safety. In conclusion, the only supporters of the application are all people associated with the home but don't live near it, whereas all the objectors do. We urge you to reject this unsympathetic and over-intensive extension of this commercial business into the semi-detached residential property adjoining our home. The proposal would have an unacceptable detrimental impact on our residential amenity and our quiet enjoyment of our home and garden. It would also have a significant adverse impact on surrounding neighbors. Together with the incongruous two-story link building, the proposal would have an adverse impact on the character and appearance of this attractive residential area of Blackpool. Please refuse planning permission for this inconsiderate overdevelopment. Thank you for listening. Presented uh, this afternoon by Mr. Wheatman and by Miss Harrington, um, they know they have seven minutes between them to address the committee and I invite them to start now. Mr. Wheatman. Have you unmuted? I think Mr. Wheatman, we can't hear you. Sorry, Miss Harrington's going first. Oh, sorry. Yes, fine. 
Miss Harrington. Miss Harrington. Yes. Okay, thank you for inviting me to talk today. I've worked at the Golden Years for 17 years and I have to say it's been quite a challenge in getting my thoughts down on paper. I'm sure you're all aware that the care sector is facing big changes, challenges and new regulations. Yesterday, I spent most of today testing the hands of COVID. Another new regulation that is coming into force within care homes is that we're now expected to provide an isolated space for those either suspected or confirmed with COVID. We feel we are in a very fortunate position to provide the facilities that are now becoming mandatory. This could actually end up leaving a number of care homes having to reduce their registration to implement the changes. But that aside, I have been keeping track of the comments and one of the common themes within the objections seems to be in relation to noise. We've been open for over 30 years and we've never once received a noise complaint from either the neighbours or the council. And yet we've always had people live with us that have dementia. We're talking about an extra five people who are aged 80 years, up, 80 years and older. I understand their old worries due to the walls being adjoined, but I also feel there is an element of discrimination towards people with dementia. They're not kept in the rooms all day, they're generally in the lounges, or if the weather permits it, they're outside in the garden. Having next door would mean we could create a multi-purpose room for arts and crafts and bingo and other little things like that. We were also considering using one of the four rooms for end of life, so it would be a lovely bit to be able to provide a larger room with a sofa bed in. That way, those who have family that live far away don't have to pay out for hotels to spend time with the families in the final days. When we mentioned this idea to our local doctors and nurses with whom we've got a close relationship with, they fully supported us and agreed that there was a lack of service in the area. Um, especially when you take into consideration that over the last few months, the number of people that have passed away with no family or loved ones surrounding them, that really does highlight a need for a change in this area. Another concern was in regards to lack of parking spaces. Out of the 14 staff members that actually work here, only four drive. Um, if it was the planning model to go ahead, we'd only require one extra staff member. Shift changes would remain the same, being 8am, 2pm and 8.30. There'd be no increase in nurses visits as all visits are blocked together. So one nurse will come and see X amount in one go. I'd also like to make you aware that most residents who come to live with us don't have any family. Aside from the odd social worker or nurse visit, it's just us we have. We become their families, which is why the extension means so much to us. Thank you for allowing me to talk today. Yeah, so very thoughtful, Miss Harrington, and uh, we appreciate uh, your considerable care and um, support of those in in your um, in your care home. Uh, you do have a difficult job, and I'm sure we appreciate all that you've told us, um, Mr. Wheatman. You want to uh, you want to use up the rest of the seven minutes? Thank you very much, Chair, uh, and thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. Just to uh, establish where I come from, I'm a Chartered Town Planner, I have been since 1987. I'm the ex-head of planning at St. Helens Council, and I also work for Trevor Roberts Associates, training councillors and planning officers alike. You've already heard from the manager of the care home about some of the challenges they are currently facing, and they will continue to face, especially since COVID-19 has uh, hit uh, the care home industry in a long way. But I would like to concentrate on the planning issues. Um, the principle of development first. Um, the issue uh, around policy, which you yourself, Chair, has said is a well-established policy, is, is 20 years old. And it's not really fit for um, the current situation. It's also a somewhat uh, clumsy, clumsy uh, policy in the sense that um, it, uh, contains a number of issues and question marks about that leave it open to interpretation. For example, it uses the phrase about 10%. Now, I know the officer's report talks about the uh, extension of, the, of this property uh, and the um, uh, create uh, and sharing into number 51 will create a third unit. Well, it won't. Uh, quite simply, the expanded planning unit 
will single, still be one single planning unit. It won't create a third care home. It will just enlarge the second care home, which it currently is. For example, if you have a, a, a house and you extend that house and that house uh, then incorporates the house next door it, into one house, it is still a single house. It doesn't create two houses. So the report is wrong to suggest this will create a third care home in the area and therefore 20%. It remains the second care home in the area and 14%. And your policy says about 10%. And that about is leaves it open to interpretation. I also um, would like to pick up on the points in paragraph 1117 of the officer's report, where the officer says compliance with all elements of the policy must be secured in order for a proposal to be supported. That's not how the policy is written. The policy suggests there are a number of different issues that need to be addressed in every single case for a, a C2 use, regardless of what it is, and you look at each part individually. And it lists them, and again, it sort of says a management plan, the suitability of the premises and location. So it is not as cut and dried as the report says. And I'm sure the officer will come back and refute what I'm saying, but that is my uh, professional interpretation. Design, the proposed extension will barely be seeable you will barely be able to see it. It is set back 12 meters from the, uh, the back of the pavement and 5.7 meters from the front of each property. You would therefore have to be stood in front of it virtually for it to be even visible. And even then it would be visible behind the existing buildings. So to, to suggest that it is incongruous and adversely affects the street scene when it is set so far back is something personally and professionally I cannot agree with. And the final point is noise and disturbance. There are no objections from the council's environmental health officer. You have just heard from the manager that there have never been any objections or complaints about the use of this site. This current situation is that the existing site abuts number 51. All that will happen is the current site will abut number 53, hence why number 53's uh, occupiers objections. But the reality is overlooking and all the rest of it exists from number 51 now. That situation does not change. And as such minutes. members, I would uh, respectfully request that this application be approved. Thank you. I don't think we can hear you. Can't hear you, Chair. I think I'm having the same trouble as Councillor Jackson earlier. Can't get my mutes with, away from my unmutes. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah. Mr Shaw, to respond, if he wishes to, to those points. Just a couple of points, uh, Chair. Um, yeah, I think we're all fully aware and we're all sympathetic with the with the ongoing uh, COVID um, crisis and, and the implications that that has for not just the applicant's care home, but all the other care homes as well, a number of which are located in Blackpool. The point about noise, uh, Ms. Ms. Harrington made, um, not having had any complaints in 30 years. I think the the, the what we would highlight is the fact that um, the, the current home is freestanding, occupying two properties, or what, what were two properties, uh, and it would extend into a third property. And as a result of that extension into the third property, it would it would share a party wall with a with a, a, a single dwelling house. Um, Mr. Wheatman's comments about um, the the interpretation of the policy um, made a number of comments. 
the, the, the fact is the, 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 the existing home occupies two properties or what were two properties. So in terms of interpreting the percentage of the block that those properties um, occupy at the moment and would occupy as a, as, as a result of the extension, um, it's, it's, uh, it, it seems clear to me that the, the, um, the, the interpretation of the policy is that it would occupy three out of 15 within the block and, uh, and the block is being interpreted uh, as between Cornwall Avenue and Clayter Avenue, which is half the block between Argyle and Gosworth, but 20% um, of the block, three out of 15 between Cornwall and Clayter. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, colleagues, uh, the discussion, the recommendation is for uh, refusal with the conditions, uh, the reasons for the refusal is on page 56. Um, does anybody want to speak in favour or against that, that recommendation? Uh, Councillor Stansfield, do you want to come in? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yeah, I can understand the concerns of the uh, manager of the care home. Um, we do have huge problems with finding care facilities. But having said that, I don't think this is the right um, place for it. With regards to Mr Wheaton's comments, um, as far as when you develop one property into a second property, it becomes one property. As we all know, we can make statistics, prove or disprove anything we like, as was in the case with Stephen Hawking, uh, with his brief theory of time. It was the same statistics that proved that his first theory was wrong. So we can actually make those say what we want. The fact remains, it does breach our policy. Uh, and there really is no reason why this application should be anything other than refused under the uh, reasons that the officers have recommended. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Councillor Williams, please. Yes, I'm just following on what Councillor Stansfield has said. I, I think it's a, for me, it's a, it's a clear overdevelopment of the site. Um, and I'm less concerned about the street view rather than the impacts and the amenities of, of the other you know, near, very near residents. Um, so I agree, support the recommendation, Chair. Anybody else? Uh, Councillor Coleman. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, it sounds like there's a consensus on the committee, but I just want to um, stress that it's not a reflection on the care that's given by Golden Years. By all accounts, everybody seems to say it's, it's an excellent facility. Um, so even if the decision goes against um, Miss Harrington, um, it's no reflection on the quality of the care that's given. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. The recommendation is to refuse the application. Is that proposed? Councillor Williams? Oh, Councillor Jackson's proposing refusal. Is that seconded? Uh, Councillor Stansfield seconds. Uh, those in favour of the motion, please show. That's unanimous, Chairman. That's unanimously rejected. The application stands refused for the conditions, uh, for the reasons set out on page 56. Thank you very much. Um, the next item is... Chairman, at this point, could I just um, wait for the public speakers to leave the meeting, please? Miss Harrington and Mr. Wheatman are leaving us. Fine. Um, so we're turning now our attentions to the application for 433 Midland Road development uh, for a site for travellers. Um, this was uh, Pippa Greenway's matter, but uh, I think Susan is going to deal with it in uh, without her colleague's presence. 
There we go. I will do if I can find my unmute button. Right. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this application is before you members because it represents departure from planning policy and because it's felt to be of wider public interest. The site falls within the Martin Moss strategic area and the Martin Moss conservation area, and it's a greenfield site. The proposal is for the siting of two static caravans, two touring caravans and two amenity buildings on the site. These will be set towards the rear and will be screened from Midland Road by a hedgerow. If I can try and show you the site layout plan. There we go. So this is Midland Road um, along this side here. Planning permission has already been granted for the erection of a stable block with associated paddock and hard standing. Now, as I think um, you're all aware, as a local planning authority, the council is required to identify the need for gypsy and traveller sites within the borough. The identified need in the 2016 review of the Failed Coast Gypsy Traveller and Travelling Show People Accommodation Assessment was for six pitches up to 2031. As this need covers the Failed Coast and as the neighbouring borough of Failed over provided by four pitches, the requirement in Blackpool was reduced to two pitches as of 2018. Members will recall that planning permission was granted for one pitch at number 411 Midland Road in February of 2019, and two pitches were granted on sites on School Road in July 2019. As such, there is currently no unmet need for traveller sites in Blackpool. As such, the key consideration against which to judge this application in policy terms then becomes policy CS26 of the core strategy. This policy precludes development of, that is not essential in relation to agriculture or other rural activities until a neighbourhood plan for the area is produced. Members will note that the applicant has submitted information in support of their proposal, and this is detailed in the officer report. In addition, the 2015 Planning Policy for Traveller Sites document identifies the considerations that should be taken into account when assessing such proposals. And again, these are covered in detail in the officer report. Although the personal circumstances of the applicant are recognised, it is also noted that the youngest child is preschool age and there will be therefore no disruption to education if permission were refused. The eldest grandchild currently lives in Thornton and so there will be no requirement for him to move to the site to continue his health care. Similarly, the applicant's wife's ill health is currently being managed in the northeast, and so there would be a discontinuance of existing health care if she relocated. As such, officers feel that there are no personal circumstances that would be sufficient to outweigh the conflict with planning policy. The application site is not considered to be in a sustainable location and lacks easy connectivity to local community facilities. The proposal itself is con considered to be suitable in scale and landscaping could be provided to prevent unacceptable visual impact. The amenity of neighbours would not be unduly accepted. However, when viewed overall and given the lack of any established need for the development, the conflict with policy and the impact the proposal would have on the character and function of the Martin Moss strategic site is judged to be overriding. As such, members are respectfully recommended to refuse the application. Show you, show you some of the elevation drawings quickly in the layout plans of the buildings. Oh. Yeah, thanks very much for that, uh, Susan. Um, we don't seem to have any representations or objections to the application. Is that right, Bernadette? That's right, Chairman. There's no one applied to speak. Right. So it's uh, up to the committee how you want to deal with the application, which, of course, is recommended for refusal for the reasons Miss Parker has outlined. Um, so page 76 gives the reasons for refusal if you would go along with the recommendation generally. Uh, members, debate, discussion, anybody want to speak on it? If only to support the recommendation. Councillor Williams. Yeah, I, I, um, thank you, Chair. I just want to ask, um, how does it, because I noticed there was an actually sort of supportive comments from other, from nearby neighbours, yet there seems to have been obviously some feedback with the Martin Moss, the planning thing. Um, and how that kind of ties together. And I suppose um, I'm just curious at how we, because when we talk about unmet need in terms of the health issues, but there is obviously, do we dispute that there is an unmet need in terms of, of available sites or suitable sites? Because the evidence the applicant seems to have brought and how does that fit with, you know, with the, with the policy? 
I understand what what policy, you know, what you're saying, the reason for the decision. I'm just curious how it all fits together. Um, I suspect we need a seminar on that. <laughs> Miss Parker, do you want to answer that thorny question or is it not um, so thorny? I'll, I'll try to, Chair. Um, I, I think that the answer is that it, it is a balance and, and obviously personal circumstances do have to be taken into account. Um, but it is that balance with um, the policy uh, criteria or the, the, the policy stance. Um, the, the guidance in the national uh, documents explains what is meant by personal circumstances. So, for example, if to refuse planning permission would compromise the continuation of education or healthcare, that would be given greater weight um, than in a circumstance like this, where in actual fact the family would be relocating from the northeast and um, that the grandchild that lives in the area is already accommodated in Thornton. Um, so in terms of that weight to be attached to the personal circumstances, there are different considerations to be taken into account. In terms of the over-concentration, uh, no, not the over-concentration, sorry, the um, lack of, of unmet, unmet need, um, members might recall um, at the meeting in July last year, we brought, uh, I think it was two applications in the end um, to you. Um, where we where we had an application, or if we were to have an application in what we considered to be a suitable location, um, an example would be the, the one off uh, Midland Road further down. Um, I can't think of the road, I'm afraid. It was, it was much closer to the settlement and it was judged to be a sustainable location and an appropriate location. If a gypsy and uh, traveller site was proposed in a location outside of the Martin Moss strategic site, the key policy to judge it against them would be um, CS16, which, which relates specifically to, to gypsy and traveller sites. However, because this does fall within Martin Moss, it's policy CS26, which takes precedent because we are in a position of not having any outstanding unmet need. It's, it's similar to the situation with housing, where if you're in a position of housing need, that tilts the balance of how you apply a planning policy. In this case, because we don't have any unmet need, that again affects the way that we, we weigh the policy balance. Does that answer the question to any extent? We don't have any unmet need. Yeah, but I think, but I think the point I was kind of getting, which is that, because we, we could be here, Chair, as you were, were discussing about this unmet need, couldn't we? Because it's unmet need as, as decreed by, by statute, by, by policy. What uh, I was kind of getting at was that, well, is there actually an unmet need, you know, practically locally for, for tra you know, for traveller sites? We may not, we may have, have provided all that we are required to do so, but the result, you know, what seems to be, you know, what the applicant is saying that having tried to move on to other sites, there isn't any other suitable in the, that's, that's the only point I was getting at. I understand we're yeah. bound by that, so mm -hmm. I'll shut up now. <laughs> Well, there was a lot of nibbling goes on on Martin Moss and has done over the years, and I suppose it's only another manifestation of that, isn't it? Um, anybody else? Or is somebody prepared to uh, to move refusal for the grounds? Reason stated. Councillor Baker moves refusal, seconded by Councillor Stansfield. Uh, would those in favour please show? And those against? That's unanimous, Chairman. A unanimous decision. Uh, the matter stands refused. Um, I think it's my turn to disappear. So I think I've got to shut down the video. And over to Councillor, Councillor O'Hara as our Vice Chair. <laughs> Chairman, if I could just ask you, I'll put you in the waiting room whilst this application has been determined. So, um... Right, I'll take over. I'm a... <laughs> Sorry, just one moment, please. I just need to put uh, Councillor Owen in the, in the waiting room.
Okay, Councillor Owen uh, is now in the waiting room. Thank you. Right, Thanks. if if we can start, who's presenting it? Is it Susan that's presenting it? Thank you, Councillor O'Hara. Um, right, this last application, I'll just get the slideshow up for you. There we go. The last application um, is before members, sim as explained, simply because uh, in the interest of transparency, as Councillor Owen, Chairman of the Committee, has declared a personal interest in the scheme. The application relates to numbers three to five Westcliff Drive, which is currently used as a solicitor's office at ground and first floor level, and the site falls within the Leighton District Centre. The application seeks significant external alterations at upper floor level to create two self-contained flats. The existing flat roof, oh, let's see if I can find you a, an aerial view, there we go. So this existing flat roof would be replaced by a traditional dual pitch roof and two bay windows would be created, as you can see here on the elevations. Both of the flats would, uh, sorry, one of the flats would offer a single bedroom, the other would offer two bedrooms, and both would meet the council's minimum floor space and amenity standards. The first floor would be extended in this section here at the rear to accommodate um, the, the requirements for the flats, but this is acceptable as the site lies outside of the defined inner area, and also because no garden space would be lost as a result. The scheme would not exacerbate an existing over concentration of flats in the area because the area is dominated by housing. Uh, residents would have access to a small communal terrace here at the back for the storage of refuse and the drying of clothes. The site is in a very accessible location and residential use above the commercial uh, premises is acceptable in principle. We feel the scheme would deliver a good standard of amenity without compromising that of the neighbours and the external alterations are considered to be suitable. Um, no other issues have been identified that would weigh against the scheme. And so on that basis, the officer recommendation is one of, refu of approval. Sorry, thank you. Right, I, I take it there are no speakers on this uh, application? Uh, no, Chairman, nobody's registered to speak on this application. Right. Are there any? Is there anybody who wants to speak? Anybody? Um, Does that mean? Sorry, uh, chair. No, oh, no, oh. I, I, no. I think I've said enough this afternoon. I'll just move to uh, to approve the. Right, is there a second? Yeah, is there a seconder? There's a, a dozen. I'll give Councillor Robertson <laughs> for his hand up, so I'll let him have a go at second. <laughs> All those in favour? That's unanimous, Chairman. Right, thank you. Uh, presumably now Councillor uh, Owen will be back. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. I'll bring uh, Councillor Owen back into the meeting. It's a good job I see Teal here, strongly represented. Um, just a little point on item nine. I understand uh, item ten. I understand you have approved the application. There's some misgivings on my part because I don't know how many of you remember Gordon McKeith. Um, he was a noted local architect. Um, in recent years, he looked after the interests of the Grand Theatre. But for years and years and years, he was, and his family, father before him, uh, the house architects of the tower company responsible for the tower and the winter gardens. And when he qualified as an architect in 1965, this was his very first project. And um, the 
sort of feel a little bit of Blackpool history is gone with this development. Um, it was an unusual shaped site and uh, he made quite a spectacular and interesting, um, you know, a building, certainly exterior, was quite unusual. Um, but that's another bit of Blackpool disappearing fast, isn't it? At least we're keeping the ground for elevations. Um, item 11, a date of your next meeting, um, it's listed for the 7th of July. Are we happy with that? Uh, whether we come back um, in this fashion, I, I suspect we probably will. I don't think it's anything that any of us particularly likes. Um, I'm certainly not very good at pressing the right buttons at the right time, um, but maybe we'll have to get used to it all. Thank you, everybody, and our officers and those who've tried to give us um, their observations from afar. Um, I think it's been a useful meeting, very interesting, and I'm grateful for all your support. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Chair. Thank you.